Well, Kate, unless you've been hiding in a hole for the last few years, I think it's pretty clear that we've entered a new era of geopolitical competition, perhaps as intense and as, uh, uh, as long, long live, perhaps, as the one that uh, preceded it uh, in the Cold War. But it's a very different kind of geopolitical competition in ways that we're going to talk a little bit about today, quickly, on the panel that we have here today. Um, one of the, China, of course, is the centerpiece of this, and we're going to talk a little bit about China and how it approaches the competition and what that, the significance of that is from a, from a broader uh, energy and, and, and geopolitical standpoint. But it's not just about China. We are in what I would consider to be, and this is something we do at E&Y where I work with our geostrategic business group, one of the things that we talk about when we advise our clients about the uh, nature of the environment, uh, the business environment they're in, is the fact that this is in fact a multipolar world, one in which, yes, is in some degree compatible or, or constrained by the aspects of the Chinese-U.S. competition, but in fact there are many countries jockeying for power, influence, and leverage around the world. Some large, some medium-sized, some actually fairly small, but still significant because they have certain resources or they're located in certain key places geographically. And we're going to talk about one of those regions today, Oceania, within the context of the, uh, the project that uh, TCU is launching on. So this multipolar competition is not just around a number of different countries, but it is a full spectrum competition, unlike what we dealt with in the Cold War. It's not just about how many missiles one, size ha one side has or how many cruisers or destroyers. It's really about bringing to bear all of the resources that we as a country and our allies have to bear in order to be able to compete effectively, economic, cultural, political, diplomatic, and, po uh, and military, of course. But what we're really going to focus on here, obviously, is economics and in particular the role that energy can play in the competition that we're talking about today. And if you've probably heard of another little thing called the Belt and Road Initiative, which China is rolling out in, around the world. And I just want to have a little quote here uh, from a fellow called Larry Summers that you might have heard of that I think summarizes the nature of the competition and the challenge that we face. He says, I do think in many ways the most profound question for American foreign policy, and it's one that very much implicates economic policy, is that is right and just as we feel we are, there are just a large number of countries that are not aligned with us or that are only weakly aligned with us. I heard a comment somebody in a developing country who said, Look, I like your values better than China's, than I like China's, but the truth is when we're engaged with the Chinese, we get an airport. And when we're engaged with you guys, we get a lecture. So in many respects, that's the nature of the challenge that we're facing. We've got to come up with tangible, sustainable, workable solutions that we can engage these countries with, and that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about here. TCU has initiated a project with the Department of Defense that you'll hear about called Project Oceania, which is designed to help think about bringing innovative energy solutions to a region of the world that is increasingly significant from a geopolitical standpoint, geostrategic standpoint. All you have to do is understand the history of the Pacific War to understand how the various island chains that are across the South Pacific are increasingly significant from a geopolitical standpoint. So with that thought in mind, what I'd like to do is engage the panel members here to provide some perspective on the broader aspects of this competition and tell you a little bit about Project Oceania. Kyle Bass, uh, TCU alumni, talk a little bit, if you would, tell, give some additional context about China and its strategy and what it's trying to achieve to, to provide uh, a, a broader understanding of where, we, of where they're going, what they want to do. Well, first of all, glad to be here, Jay. Thank you, Anne. Uh, and TCU, it's, it's great to be back. Uh, when I was in school here, we didn't have events like this, so uh, uh, TCU is, is coming a long way. I'm a, I'm a grad, 92 grad, and uh, very happy to be back here. Uh, Jay, one of the things you mentioned uh, in, your, in your opening is this, uh, the, number one, the competition between uh, the U.S. and China. Uh, how many of you in here have read the Director of National Intelligence's Threat Assessment Report to Congress that gets filed every year? I'd love to see a show of hands. I kind of One, to. two, three, four. I suggest you read it. Um, yes. Most of Wall Street hasn't read it. It's a declassified report. Uh, it is the amalgamation of all 16 intelligence agencies' work on the threats to U.S. national security. Uh, it gets declassified and reported to Congress every March. Um, in there, it talks about uh, the list of countries that provide the largest threats to U.S. national security in the, in the next year and coming years. 
And for the last, call it five reports, you've seen in this order, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Um, they're not competitors, they are our adversary. Uh, and so we can be politically correct and say there are strategic competitors. When you talk to the people in intelligence and in, in, the, in our military, people that are working on grand strategy, we know who the enemy is and it is China. And I know we're at an educational institution where we have Chinese nationals and I'm sorry that that's the case. I wish it wasn't the case, but Chinese belligerence globally uh, is bringing the world to a potential uh, inflection point. We've seen what Russia did with Ukraine, and uh, when you see China potentially move on Taiwan to the point we're making about energy security, um, this is going to be a, a tectonic event. We're kind of at a hinge in history, and for those of you that need to realize who the enemy is, go read the reports. Um, they're out there. And so when we talk about Oceania, uh, what's functionally relevant to Oceania in our meeting with Admiral Paparo, who commands the U.S. Pacific Fleet, um, if you look at the Solomon Islands, the Marshall Islands, you look at what kind of soft power diplomacy that's going on with China, and what they're really interested in is, number one, geostrategically, we know where those island, those island chains are, and if you look back to World War II, we had some pretty big battles back there uh, in, in those specific areas, and in fact, we almost lost the Pacific Fleet, if it not were for a, a young man named Joe Rochefort, who decided to jump the chain of command and broke the, broke the code, uh, the Japanese, thank God. Uh, for those of you that haven't read about Joe Rochefort, I suggest you go read about him. Uh, unsung hero uh, for the United States. But I think when you go back to uh, the, the energy issue in the, in the, call it Oceania writ large and then Southeast Asia writ large, almost all the islands run on bunker fuel, yeah. right? Uh, and so we must come up with um, a different plan for these island nations to have more self-sustainable energy. Uh, China uses all kinds of bribery, um, whether it's outright bribery or implicit bribery, um, special access to their markets and charm offensives in Oceania to try to f swing these governments uh, into recognizing China, de-recognizing Taiwan, which we've seen across, across the board in Oceania. Uh, but uh, as it gets closer to a potential kinetic conflict, uh, we have to, we as a country must invest uh, in helping those various areas of, of Oceania um, um, become more energy self-sufficient and also um, not stoop to China's levels of, again, coercion and bribery and, and all the things they do uh, to, to turn the local governments to those islands. And you're seeing it in real time if you just go Google some of these islands and what's going on in the political spectrum. So I think, I think this initiative with TCU and DOD uh, is something that's vitally important for us to come up with uh, another way to ingratiate ourselves with those island nations uh, and not stoop down to the, the criminality that the Chinese stoop to. Excellent. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Ken, talk a little bit about, if you would, uh, the kind of assets and capabilities that the United States brings to this from an energy standpoint. Uh, you've been in the government, you understand the, uh, the, 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 the capabilities and, and uh, many of which are represented by the sort of people that are here today. How, the Chinese have been very effective at integrating in many respects, at least rhetorically and sometimes practically, the use of their energy capabilities into the Belt and Road program. I mean, they're building pipelines, they're building you know, energy plants, they're doing all sorts of things. What do we bring to this fight that we need to think about? How do we think about harnessing these capabilities? Well, yeah, thank you, Jay, and, and thank you, TCU and Ann. Um, first of all, I mean, you, you know, President Pullen mentioned it. You know, if you think about energy pr proliferating everything, and this is a fight to find, you know, to, to gain the favor of all of these developing countries. And right now we're talking about it in the South Pacific. Uh, but, but if you think about it, the UN Sustainable Goals, the first five, the seven is energy, the first uh, six, four of which require energy to enable them. And so energy really is at the basic of all this. And, and the, the theme of this is energy, the road to energy resilience. And uh, if you think about it, uh, whether you're in Oceania or whether you're in Oklahoma, um, if it's not affordable, it's not sustainable. And so you start, you start there. And what has America done better than anywhere else in the world. We, we have uh, allowed the world's economy to grow uh, you know, over the last 20 years based upon cheap energy. 
and it was m much of it was done right here in this energy producing region. I like to include Oklahoma in that. I'm from Oklahoma, so. Uh, but 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 uh, but, but it, if you think about it, uh, our economies were built on cheap energy, and and so what can we do better than everywhere else in, in the in the world? And that's uh, we can develop low cost, affordable, resilient energy systems if government will get out of our way to do that. And you know we're, we're the best at building pipelines. We're the best at, at finding new deposits of traditional energy. We understand how to integrate renewables. Uh, you'd look at Oklahoma and Texas, two of the largest states of renewable integration. Why does it work in our states? Na the use of natural gas. And so uh, I think the key to resiliency is understanding what the uh, resources that are available at those, in, in this case, uh, Pacific Islands, uh, understanding what those are, understanding the economics of, of how those can be made affordable or utilized in that system, understanding the political risk of, of that. And so we bring um, not only this multidisciplinary, um, multidiscipline approach to things, but we don't politicize it in the way that Russia does, right? Yeah. We've underutilized energy as a resource and, and, and I don't mean that, you know, we're, we go as markets go, right? And Dean will talk about that. But, but you know, we're, we're now one of the largest exporters of liquefied natural gas. We're uh, a net crude exporter. Um, we can do that if the government will let us do that. And so why don't we take those things and use those assets as, as a chip to help countries get on their feet? and become our friends, not just that. And we see energy as a political, politicized both from the China and most notably from Russia and, and what they're doing to Ukraine and to Western Europe by using natural gas and, and supply as, as um, you know, a political tool to meet other ends. And so we bring the most affordable, the cleanest, uh, the most um, usable forms of energy to the, to the world. And so I think that's the main thing that we have to, to offer that. And we need to put that at the top of our arsenal because again, this is a fight for these developing countries. And to your point that they don't need a lecture, they don't want to be told that they need only to do renewable energy. They need to use whatever resources could be affordable, exactly. sustainable, exactly. and continue their, their, their way of life in an improving fashion. And let's not forget about nuclear power, which the Russians have weaponized very effectively as, a, uh, uh, as, a, as an element of statecraft, if you will. Ross Adam is operating all over the world uh, and uh, up until recently at least uh, avoided sanctions because it was so important in the supply chains of so many countries from an atomic energy standpoint. So that's another element of this equation. And tell us a little bit about Project Oceania. What is it? Uh, what's the intent? Why TCU and its partner? What, what, how, how is it being put together to help achieve the goals that Admiral Paparo and the Pacific Fleet uh, laid out for us? Um, I, you know, a variety of reasons how it came to be, but I, I would love to start with just a, a quick story of how I spent my afternoon yesterday um, in, a stu in a classroom, a political science class that uh, Jonathan Benjamin Alvarado teaches um, on national security, and he chose to use his class as a, as a test pilot, if you will, to start gathering data for this project. And so he had all his students do scenario mapping on a variety of the island nations that make up this region all with under the context of the, the DOD has asked you to present this data and what you know what what do we need to do from here? What is the best energy solution? What are the political challenges? So I was I was blown away by um, their ability to to pull this data together and we're at a month now, I think, from when we were originally charged um, with, with this task and this partnership um, and what they were able to come up with and, and the ideas and solutions and their ability to already critically think through um, the significant challenges that we face um, in that region. And these are 18, 19, and 20 year olds. Um, for a lot of us in this room, uh, uh, you know, our relationship with China is very complex and, and has, ha has, you know, taken a lot of different turns and angles depending on leadership. Um, and so to see their fresh perspective on what this looks like and then how does energy, you know, help, help solve this, 
Um, they hadn't thought about that before. I don't know that they had connected those dots. And so it was important to me that this day start with this conversation and that we have you know, students that are working on this that will now transfer that data to the experts around the country, um, which is the basis of this project. It's not all going to come from TCU. We are the conveners. OSU is our primary partner in this, um, and their, their Energy Institute under Ken's leadership. Um, we are tapping into the University of Wyoming, the University of Hawaii, um, a variety of universities that are gonna be able to bring the level of expertise on the, the, the technical side, on, on wave technology, Technology on nuclear out of Wyoming, uh, a variety of different partners that, that we think for the first time you're going to see a real universe, university level collaboration with our government, um, with the Department of Defense, um, in order to come to them in the next six months. They want all of this data um, in our findings by, by November 1st. And so it's, it's ambitious. Um, but I love that we have dipped our toes into the, the, the policy side. I think it will, we, we focus on the business of energy at, at the Neely School, um, but to be able to take the, the different areas of expertise and really hopefully come up with some real solutions um, in what I think is going to drive our energy future and what it looks like. We have been harping on the energy transition for, gosh, five years now. That's been the, the sexy phrase. And I think two months ago, we changed the entire theme of, of this conference and symposium today to, to energy resilience. Because I think when the rubber meets the road, we have got to come up with solutions, as, as you started with, that if they're not economic, um, we, are, we are leaving the world behind in regard to their own personal prosperity. And so these esoteric goals um, around what kind of energy sources we need to fuel the world um, are lovely and thoughtful and, and sometimes even artistically beautiful, depending on what you think of a windmill um, in West Texas. Um, and, but what we really have to dig into is, is what's going to be affordable for the people in the country where we are looking at new energy solutions um, and this idea that we're going to need all of it um, and I think we all probably everyone would agree in this room you'll probably hear a lot today it doesn't have to be or it needs to be and um, in regard to what are those possible solutions and our final outcome you know the goal we've been charged with and how we shifted this conversation even with the DOD is that we're going to give you some ideas and here are some suggestions depending on what are the you know geographic challenges of each one of these island nations, but if it isn't economically viable and not attractive, and maybe we kick it back to, to Kyle after this, because if, it, if it's not attractive for outside investment, and we're not able to, to really have a long-term solution for the people that live on those nations, um, then, you know, then it's for naught, right? It's a, a waste of six months of our time and resources and energy, um, no pun intended. But uh, really, the, the, the capital investment piece, right? And I think that what, what's happening to it in our industry, and so this will be a fun little test model to, to try that. I don't know, what are, what are your thoughts on that, that, that external investment? Look, I, I have a simple view of all of this, and it's uh, we can bring some alternative energy to the island nations, but we really need um, small modular nuclear is the answer in the long run. Um, we have a duration mismatch problem because uh, you know it takes still takes seven years, eight years to build those things and a fair amount of capital. Um, but you know a lot's going to happen in the next decade. And I say seven or eight years if it's fully funded, it's got the site drawn up, and we're ready to start building. So it's really ten years. Um, and so I think that's that's the key challenge here. And and as we kind of march towards a potential kinetic conflict um, with China, which I tend to think happens in the next eighteen months. Um, you know, the energy world needs to think about what happens if that happens. Uh, it'd be very different than what happens with, when Russia invaded Ukraine. China's the largest importer of both crude oil and LNG. They import 11 and a half million barrels of crude a day. They import about eight, eight billion cubic feet of LNG per day. And 90% uh, of their imports are seaborne. And so in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, some of the U.S. Navy's directives are going to be to interdict those seaborne shipments, and the energy market is going to go into a state of, uh, I think, disarray on the front end of a conflict, and I think you'll see that in the next couple of years. So how we allocate our resources here uh, is important to think about if you are a, an operator or if you're, a, if you're someone that's considering you know, investing in hydrocarbons today, which clearly in our transition we must keep doing, uh, as you've said, 
um, we're the best in the world at, at hydrocarbons. Um, I think you need to be thinking about how, what kind of leverage structure you take, how you hedge your output, uh, because imagine we saw crude go negative uh, during COVID because we had nowhere to put it. Something like that could happen again if we start interdicting, you know, eight, nine million barrels a day that's seaborne. So all of these questions from a global geost geostrategic perspective in the near term are important. In the long term, we need to start funding these projects. Um, with small modular nuclear. I think the very first facility opening in the United States will open in um, uh, y, uh, uh, Montana in about seven years from now, right? The first small modular nuclear facility is, is set to open here. So I think we need to um, really accelerate our investment in, in nuclear personally. I don't know yeah. where, where you are on this. Yeah, but. exactly. Uh, it, it, talk a little bit about what, you know, if you would. Thanks, Kyle. That, uh, I agree with you. In fact, on, unfortunately, some of that uh, timeline you're talking about, I think it's nearer than, than further out. But talk a little bit about what we, the government can do to help, you know, to get out of the way in one sense. But what else can it do to incent, you know, the investment in these areas that we need to build up in order to be competitive in these energy areas and bring it to the region that we're talking about here? Where can the government play a positive role? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so we've seen that, right? We've seen... Um, the idea that we're going to incentivize supply with with the three major pieces of legislation that have happened in the last three years okay. the energy act of 2020 the uh the the bipartisan infrastructure law and then of course the in inflation reduction act where where they do just that right they incentivize uh, all of these uh technology agnostic um you know fuel sources as well as specifics like renewables specifics like hydrogen uh, and, and other technologies, uh, geothermal, that sort of thing. Um, so, so we're already doing that, but you don't see a dollar of that money deployed because we can't get a permit. You know, we, we talk about carbon capture as though it's ubiquitous, right? We're, we're gonna reduce carbon through sequestering it in deep geologic formations. And, you know, four years ago when I became secretary, or five years ago when I became secretary in the state of Oklahoma, we, we went to, and I came directly from EPA, we went to Congress and said, you're going to need to give EPA more, more resources, which sounds counterintuitive, right? Um, but, but there's only 15 people nationwide that can work on a, a, a class six or deep geologic uh, permit to sequester carbon. And the last permit that was issued was 2014. And we, four, five years later, after all of that, they still haven't issued another permit. And so how do you intend to deploy $40 billion of incentive money when the government can't give you one permit? And so those two things are at a loggerhead. You know, you need, if you want, you want to uh, unleash the power of the people in this room, open up federal lands, make uh, permitting an LNG terminal easier. And so this idea that's bouncing around Congress about permit reform is real. And it's not just, I mean, every single federal dollar that has been deployed or, or has been authorized um, before it can be deployed requires NEPA analysis. And that's roads, bridges, you know, water infrastructure, uh, you name it. It's not just hydrocarbon projects. It's not just geoth ge geothermal projects. It's every single dollar that will be deployed will require some form of that. So if we as a nation don't do that, you're talking several years just for the, the NEPA analysis. And so um, exactly. I think that'll be a big election uh, boom. Is what happened to all this you know, trillion dollars of infrastructure money and incentive money that isn't being deployed? And so I think that's, that, that's the, the, the number one thing the government can do to get out of the way. Now, as far as you know, helping you know, developing world, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a program uh, to take technology, to take all forms of energy and, and, and counsel them not give the lecture that you're talking about, about um, you, you need to clean up your, uh, you know, your energy profile. You need to go from burning dung and, and, and wood inside, biomass inside your home to powering yourself with solar and wind. When, when you know, the, the, the life expectancy of, of, a, of, of a developing country with, that gets fossil energy um, in 40 years will more than double. And so, uh, or, you know, I think 
Abu Dhabi is a great example of that. The Emirates, when they, they, were, they subsisted on pearl diving and subsistence living, 40 years after they found oil, their average life expectancy went up 27 years. So developing countries are going to do what's in their best interest. And Absolutely. so we need to get out of their way. Before we open to questions, I want to just ask Kyle one final question. In lieu of what uh, uh, we just heard in terms of uh, what Ken was saying with regard to what the government needs to do, how do you see the role of the private sector in particular? You come out of the financial industry, you understand how markets work. What can we do to incent the private sector to be involved in this, perhaps in ways that, or what's going to make the private sector, right, you know, see this as an opportunity? That your point on, uh, let's just say, um, uh, the class six wells, uh, carbon sequestration wells under EPA, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're in this business. We are actively working with uh, another TCU grad at Quantum Energy, Will, who was here earlier, uh, in putting together a carbon, big carbon sequestration well on the coast. And uh, as you know, states are applying for primacy over the EPA, and that, I think that should happen. If states get primacy over EPA, um, I think this process will move a lot faster. Uh, the problem is there's slow rolling state primacy um, across the board. Yeah. Uh, and so as soon as that happens, I think these permits will come much faster, just like, they, just like we have with oil and gas wells, right? All a carbon sequestration wells are reverse oil and gas well. It just has to have the same structure, same, really same geology. It can't have faults. It's, it's not that difficult to, to underwrite this geophysically. So the private sector is actually spending money today in a big way. Um, there's a big land grab for poor space to sequester because the, the Inflation Reduction Act's um, tax credit for the sequestration at $85 a ton is uh, more than financially uh, enough to generate significant IRRs if you have the right structure and you have the right partner with it that's an emitter. And on the, on the hydrogen side, you know, the state of Texas already has uh, money being put into billions of dollars already uh, being put into uh, two huge blue hydrogen projects. One, uh, OCI's project down in Beaumont, they're a Middle Eastern firm, but they're gonna put two, three billion dollars into a blue hydrogen, blue ammonia project. And then you have the Blue Hydrogen Hub that you saw Enios uh, and a number of big players announce just south of Houston. Uh, so I see the private sector moving forward quickly. They're trying to get the permits as fast as they can. Uh, invariably, when you're building on the coast, you're going to ruin wetlands, you're going to ruin endangered species habitats. Those things have to come quicker. Uh, and then the, if, if state primacy happens over EPA, I think, I think that'll be a very positive thing. But um, to your point, we're still years away. It's not months away. Yeah. And, uh, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I wanted to open the uh, analyst. You had something else you wanted to add. No, I would say we've got a couple of yeah, our I students want to open the here, questions. Valeria and Luke in the back. You can okay. write a question on the notepads in the middle and just hand them if you want to write one. Um, we want to try to stay on time, so we'll probably just take two or three on this panel. Um, but if we have one right away, go ahead and raise your hand just for time's sake. We'll bring the mic to you. So thanks so much for an insightful panel. Uh, for Kyle and for Jay, really, a question. When you talk about Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, three of the four kind of fall into one bucket where if you isolate them, no harm, no foul. From a global perspective, the economy holds together. With China, our U.S. relationship's pretty complicated, right? I mean, they're our largest trading partner. They're a third of our trade de deficit for goods. They are, as we're plowing into an energy transition, they're over half the processing of, or refining of earth minerals. They're the second largest holder of U.S. treasuries, so they're also funding the deficits that we're running from a financial perspective. So they are exercising leverage, and to your point, Jay, about the Larry Summers quote, not only do they get an airport, but in the case of Uganda, China takes the airport back. You know, and, and in Lunev, Sri right? Lanka as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how do you evolve the model given the complication of that relationship? Because your, your views, by the way, are very much aligned with the security app, apparatus inside Washington, D.C. But from a nuanced perspective and an economic perspective, what would be the levers that you'd pull? Um, look, I think that um, we are, you know, Semi, we're reliant on China for a number of goods, right? We were in almost a $400 billion a year trade deficit. We have a $27 trillion economy. So, um, you know, if, if all of a sudden 
our relationship with China was severed. What the U.S. is best at is adaptation. We have the best universities in the world. We have the largest number of entrepreneurs, biggest entrepreneurial spirit. We will immediately adapt the rest of the supply chains for those companies that haven't moved their supply chains yet. You know, we've been talking about reshoring, onshoring, nearshoring, whatever term you want to use, really for about three years. Uh, and if you look at the IMF put out a really good study on this recently about the, those, term, that, those terms being used. Um, and look, even Apple is finally you know, turning the aircraft carrier and has moved a quarter of its production outside of China to India. It takes time. Uh, and those CEOs that I meet with in the Fortune 500 behind closed doors all agree with what we're saying. Yep. And they're, doing, they're moving as fast as they can. They just can't make a press release about it for fear of China grabbing some of their PP&E. China has recently updated their laws uh, that basically say if you're going to comply with a foreign sanction, Beijing now has the legal authority to seize your assets and detain you as an expat. Uh, and that, you probably saw, they just raided Bain and Company's yeah. headquarters in Shanghai. Yeah. They raided the Minsk Group. They just cut all data flow to, to the West. No more corporate, no more macro data in the data aggregators. That just happened. Even research universities, like the Ivy Leagues, have been cut off. So when I think about the, the decoupling and it being, a, a, um, let's say, a more complicated scenario, um, Yes, we rely on them. Yes, in the, in the, if they become belligerent enough to where they actually kinetically move on Taiwan, we'll have a global recession or even global depression. The, 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 the estimates are for global GDP dropping 35 to 8%. I think 8% is draconian. Uh, but those are real numbers, right? Um, so unfortunately, the, the tyrannical despots that run Russia and China um, don't use economics as their, uh, as their uh, dividing rod. You know, if Putin was making an economic decision, he wouldn't have invaded Ukraine, but he did it anyway. Right. Right? These people are ideological, they're dogmatic, and they are trying to make their mark on history. Uh, and so, unfortunately, we have, we have, we have now come, we've come away from the peace dividend, uh, of, call it uh, peace through trade, and now we're at a point in time in which you have two tyrannical despots running the world on the bad guy side of things. And unfortunately, uh, absent a, a, an untimely death of Xi Jinping, if you just read what he says, this is happening. Uh, and so I think we're gonna end up having a full decoupling between the two. Yeah, and I just might add to that, the companies I talked to, Kyle's exactly right, this decoupling, if you will, or, or, or uh, reshoring of, of supply chains is really accelerating. I think the understanding that the regime in Beijing has very specific goals that they are pursuing that are all about self, uh, you know, improving their own strategic capability, self-reliance, all that sort of stuff is dawning on just about everybody. There are some exceptions, Volkswagen, Siemens, people who continue to pour money into China. If I were Volkswagen, I have to say something right now. I mean, God help us if we're using Volkswagen as our as our guiding light. Exactly. <laughs> I, that, I, I, and I'll tell you, that's a company that's going to really get burned because they're coming right at them in Europe with EVs. So they've not quite figured out that this is not a strategy for long-term success. One final question we got, and I guess this is uh, addressing some specific needs within Oceania. Aren't the threat of sal salinization of freshwater and problem of waste management a more immediate need? And the answer to that is it's a very significant need out there, no question about it. If you look at what the Oceania countries are saying, they have a list of things that uh, they want to see addressed. These are very high on the, uh, on the agenda. There's no two ways about it uh, because of obviously the nature of the geography out there. They're being impacted by climate change. They're being impacted by uh, overfishing, some of which has been done by the Chinese whose Hoover-like fishing fleets move through the area with little or no regard to the, uh, to the locals' needs. And waste management management, which may in fact have an energy component to it. You know, the ability to, to, to harness that in ways that also solve the energy problems uh, are, um, uh, is, is, a, is a potential solution. But, but to back to what Ken said, energy and the ability to provide it in a sustainable, uh, reliable fashion is the foundation in many respects of long-term economic success. If you don't have that, it doesn't really matter if you've got some of the other things that uh, uh, you can't grow your food you can't desalinate your water, you can't do the things you need to do in order to develop significantly. And the countries that have figured that out 
are the ones that are ultimately going to be successful. So that's really what's lying behind what we're doing here. So in the interest of time, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. The only thing I'd just like to say, first of all, thank you to the panel. This is a great crew of people here and uh, ex examples in many respects of the assets, intellectual assets that we bring to, uh, to the fight. I'll just end by saying that geopolitics and energy have been intertwined since the dawn of the uh, petroleum era in the early part of the 20th century. As you think about this going forward, they are going to be even more intertwined. The quote unquote energy transition or the energy resilience issue is absolutely front and center of strategy in Washington and in Brussels and in every other major capital right now, including Beijing. It's going to be with us for quite some time. So understanding these factors as we think about how we approach these problems is absolutely essential to economic security as well as broader national security. With that, Anne, I'll turn it over to you, back to you. Um, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Jay, um, for coming. Actually, this whole uh, panel up here will be continuing to work on this project, um, and, and Kyle was instrumental in bringing the, the Admiral and the entire DOD team to Dallas just a month ago, where we initially set out um, to put some parameters around this project and have some realistic outcomes. Um, and so thank you very much for tackling that and taking it on. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask Megan Hayes to start working her way up. Um, a few housekeeping items. Again, if you have questions that come to mind as um, speakers are speaking, then then please do just bring them to myself or some of the students, and we'll, we'll find a way to try to get them answered. Um, my biggest takeaway of what just happened here is we got a little teaser um, for everything that, that is about to come for the day. Um, and it, it's very exciting. We'll have um, our next speaker that Megan will introduce, and then we'll move on to a, a, a much deeper dive um, into energy security with um, a modular fusion with Tara Power here and um, with Barry Davis and, and his legacy um, on all the midstream work and really being able to, to pull some of uh, different perspectives in on how we manage this. I'm excited for you to hear that. Then we get Christy Craddock, um, who's going to come talk to us about what's happening in Texas and our, our railroad commissioner um, and, and how we can we maybe best help, especially on the permitting side. I think that those will be important questions to think about as you're hearing these comments and looking at the rest of the agenda for the day. I'm going to weave some of this in, into that. Um, then, of course, Schellenberger. And then we come back over here and talk specifically about sustainable solutions and then end the day on what I think is uh, the only way this happens. I've already said it, is if we, we find a way to financially um, help, help, help build a, a stronger resilience resiliency and energy um, with, with um, Betty Chang from Quetta Suisse. So excited you're here. I'm excited to, ever, to hear from you on that.